All right, here we go again. Dirt and Sprague overtime here on the 1080 The Fan YouTube page. Dirt and I just going around, and anything that comes to our mind to talk about with a guest, we are uh, diving in. And Dirt, you know we love college football. Uh, obviously, it's a pretty popular sport. We're the home of the Ducks on 1080, and one of our good friends that we've had on a few times, Max Chadwick of uh, PFF.com. You can find some great articles at PFF.com. Give him a follow on social media as well. Uh, his latest is the ranking of the top 10 positions at pff.com also has a way too early mock from about a month or so ago. That's really interesting to dive into because the draft gets over and we instantly move uh, to the next one. But Max, thanks for hopping on with us. We know we have you on the radio show. It's good to have you on the YouTubes. How's the off season treating you so far? It's great, guys. Good to finally see your uh, your faces. I've been talking to you guys on the radio for for so many times, but uh, yeah, man, it, it's the it is the off season, but we are like full steam ahead right now. We have so many articles coming out. Um, they have been working on a massive college football preview magazine that hopefully is going to drop right before the season starts too. Um, so I, I feel like I'm working even more than I even did during the season, honestly. So it is technically the off season, but it is uh, kind of full steam ahead here in Cincinnati. Well, you mentioned some of those position uh, rankings that are starting to come out. I believe it was the pro football focus ones. I, would, I hope I'm citing the right one. But there was one that I saw that was ranking quarterback rooms in the country for this year. And it's crazy to think of how good Oregon's quarterback room is, maybe the best it's ever been, and how there's a program at USC under a head coach who is known for winning Heisman trophies with his quarterbacks who maybe is downgraded a little bit from some of the other elite ones across the country. Like if I would have told you when Lincoln Riley and Dan Lanning were hired going into year three, that Lanning would have a better quarterback room first, what would you make of that? And then just, how do you think it just, their quarterback room kind of shakes up compared to the others around the country? Yeah, it is pretty funny when you say that, right? Cause I, I ranked the top 10 quarterback rooms. Oregon was number two on that list. And there's a really good argument for them to be number one. And USC was nowhere in the top 10. Now a big reason for that, obviously is Caleb Williams is gone. They have a new starter in Miller Moss and, um, it's a little bit up in the air right now in that quarterback room and Malachi Nelson transferred out of there, former five-star recruit. Um, but also, I mean, say, I mean, Oregon, they lost a first round quarterback too and Bo Nix, but they replaced him with, I think, a top three quarterback in the country and Dylan Gabriel. And you added Dante Moore to the mix as well. Former five-star recruit, number three overall in last year's class, started a few games for UCLA. It was kind of rocky for him, but for a true freshman quarterback, as we can expect, um, he showed a lot of really, really good flashes though. And I think, he is going to be the guy for Oregon after this upcoming season uh, when Dylan Gabriel finally hangs it up. Um, so, yeah, Oregon is pretty set up set up really well for this year with Dylan Gabriel, who might be my Heisman pick, honestly. And then they're set up really well for the year after with uh, with Dante Moore. And then also Austin Novosad is the number three quarterback on the depth chart. He was a top 10 quarterback in the country coming out of high school. So, uh, yeah, that quarterback room for Oregon is, is pretty loaded thanks to a couple of huge transfers they got. What, what stands out for you diving into Oregon a little bit? Because they're going into the year, Max, with a lot of expectation, massive home game with Ohio State uh, early on in the season. What, what stands out for you so far in the Dan Lanning build and where you kind of early on see this 2024 Oregon team? Like, What's your projection or feeling of what they are as a unit in the, in the grand scheme of college football? Yeah, I, I keep saying this. You know, everyone keeps debating who's the best team in the country, Georgia or Ohio State. I think it's Georgia, Ohio State, or Oregon, honestly. I think Oregon's in that top three with those two. Uh, and I think they're closer to those two than they are to anyone else in college football, honestly. Um, the, I think it's the best offense in the country, first of all. I mean, like I said, Dylan Gabriel's top three quarterback in the country. Still have a great running back room even after losing Bucky Irving. You still have uh, Jordan James, who's going to be a breakout star, I think, this year. Uh, and Noah Whittington is a really good player as well. The offensive line is a top five offensive line in the country. You have the best receiving core in the country as well. Um, and then the defense is still really good too. You have a great secondary, really good defensive line, a really good linebacker unit as well. Um, they just missed out on, on placing in the top 10 in every single one of my position unit rankings, and they were right outside the linebacker ones. They were top 10 in defensive line, top 10 in secondary, and top 10 everywhere and on offense. Uh, it really was linebacker that they just missed out on. I do like their linebacker room too, so – yeah, I think Oregon, I mean, Dan Lanning is doing a great job there. Of just kind of, you know, what the best coaches do is just reload. They never rebuild. They always reload. And that's what he's doing right now. I mean, you lose Bo Nix, you lose some huge pieces to that team, and they're reloading, honestly, and they're still a top three team in the country. And that, like I said, that's exactly what the Alabamas did under Nick Saban. That's what George is doing under Kirby Smart. That's what the best teams do is reload. And I think Dan Lanning has that program in a spot where they're reloading right now. Yeah, I, I'm high on their wide receiver room, Max. And I saw your wide receiver rankings, and I thought, holy smokes, man, best in the country. Like, I'm, I'm super stoked about Evan Stewart. I think he has a chance to have a really big year. But 
Yeah, I look around some of the other wide receiver rooms and some of the returning stars, and maybe they don't have that number one that other schools have. But just kind of walk me behind what what made you put them number one because that uh, that's a very lofty praise going into the end of the season. I honestly, I do think they have a number one receiver. I think Tez Johnson. I think I had him as my number. Th- three or four returning at four, four, number four returning receiver in college football. So I think they have a top five receiver in the country, top 10 receiver in the country and Evan Stewart too. I mean, they were the only school that had a top two of my top 10 receivers in college football. Honestly, I think Tez Johnson, unbelievable after the catch, one of, if not the best slot receiver in college football right now. Um, and then Evan Stewart battled injuries last year at Texas A&M, but he was great as a true freshman, former top 10 overall recruit. I mean, he could be a first round pick in next year's draft. If he really explodes, like I think he can uh, next year. And then counting in that receiving core is tight ends for me. Um, so it's not just wide receivers. And they have Terrence Ferguson's a really good tight end. Um, they have Patrick Herbert is still there as well as a really good backup tight end. Um, Jurgen Dickey is a former five-star recruit. I think he's going to factor in uh, this upcoming season. Treshawn Holden comes back. They bring back basically everyone besides Troy Franklin, and you added Evan Stewart to the mix too. So that's, that's a big reason why uh, they had the best receiving core for me in the country. How, how do you how do you feel? I, I've been struggling with this because I'm I'm starting to kind of Jones for football. Basketball's about over. I know we got baseball going. Hockey's almost over. All these sports are dwindling down, and then it's a countdown to to fall camp. How, how do you parse out the Big Ten? The, this new revamped Big Ten, where you know we mentioned USC, not a lot of I think expectation this year, despite what Lincoln Riley is. Oregon's coming in. Washington was in the title game. Uh, I know UCLA is there. Like, how do you? How do you figure out what the Big Ten is to you, given the teams that have been in that conference, and now you've got these new additions? Yeah, it's it's a loaded conference, right? And I think we're we're really starting to head to a point now where it's becoming kind of a two conf, two super conferences in the Big Ten, and the SEC, um, with the four additions that they had in the Big Ten, and obviously Oklahoma and Texas going to the SEC. Uh, so yeah, I think the Big Ten is going to be really good next year. And I, I think um, you, obviously you got Ohio State, who might be the best team in the country, might be my national championship pick right now if I had to make a prediction. Uh, and then, like I said, Oregon's a top three team in the country, too. I think Michigan's a top 10 team in the country. I think Penn State's a top 10 team in the country. Um, I think uh, USC's probably in that top 20 somewhere. Um, there's some really, really good teams. And I think there's some underrated teams, too. Like I think uh, I don't know how good they will be immediately, but I think Indiana is doing a great job of rebuilding that program right now. Um, and, and like, there's always going to be teams like Iowa is always going to have an elite defense. We'll see if the offense can finally catch up. But their, their defense is going to be elite again this upcoming season. Um, yeah, it's just, it's the, one of the best conferences in America right now, and it's going to be continuously fighting the SEC. And I know we kind of talk about, oh, the power four of Big Ten, SEC, uh, ACC, and Big 12. It really is kind of turning into a power two, and then like the next two are in, in a separate tier of their own, in the ACC and Big, uh, and Big 12. Um, yeah, the Big Ten is, is absolutely loaded this year, and a big reason for that is the uh, four additions they made. Well, and then you mentioned one of those additions being Washington, who you got to go to a new conference. They're – trying to figure out their finances and they're replacing a head coach and bringing in Jed Fish. I'm just, I'm curious what you've made of his off season. That's never an easy thing to do to try and overturn a roster and try and bring transfers in um, how he's built that and how you think they can maybe fare in that first year in the big 10. Yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to take a bit for them, right? I think there is certainly um, they lost so much talent. They're, they're not going to be nearly as good as they were last year. I don't even know if they're a top 25 team in the country, which is kind of crazy for a team that just made the national championship game to not even be a top 25 team the very next preseason. Um, but that's kind of in the, the spot that they're in right now after losing Kalen DeBoer. So I like Jet Fish a lot. I love Jonah Coleman, the running back they brought in from Arizona. He's a really, really good player. Uh, Will Rogers at quarterback is going to be interesting. We'll see how he does. Uh, but I, I do think it'll be kind of a rocky year next year for Washington because not only did they lose a lot of guys to the draft, they lost like a lot of guys to the transfer portal. Of course, Jabbar Muhammad being one of them going to Oregon, uh, the cornerback. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it's going to be a rough start, I think, for for Washington in the Big Ten next year. And we'll see how they do that. I could see them going like, you know, seven and five, maybe eight and four if they have a really good year. Uh, but I don't think they'll be nearly as good as they were uh, in 2023. There, it's been it's been a little bit now, and I still think it's going to be weird to adjust our TVs and not see Nick Saban with an Alabama polo on the sidelines yelling at somebody for doing something incorrectly. But Kalen DeBoer leaves Washington after building it into a title, you know, contending team in just two years. It's controversial to take the spot of a legend. He has won everywhere he's been. There's stuff now coming out like he's way more intense and crazy than you know. It's not who he is publicly. It's what he is privately. Max, where have you landed on Kalen DeBoer, the fit at Alabama, and how you think they're going to do? 
it's going to be a brand new Alabama that we're used to, right? The Alabama under Nick Saban was defensive focused. Offense kind of came second until like the later years where uh, they really started to have great offensive coordinators. I mean, the complete opposite, right? DeBoer is one of the best offensive minds in the sport. And listen, I understand replacing the greatest coach of all time is an impossible task. They nailed this hire. I mean, this is as good of a hire as you can make, in my opinion, to kill the board. I think the only guy I would have preferred probably was Dan Lanning. Um, but even then, you can make the argument, hey, DeBoer beat him three times already. So, like, it's like you make that argument too. So, DeBoer might be a top two or three coach in the country as of right now. And like you said, he's a winner, man. He won at Fresno State. Um, he obviously won at Washington as well. He won before then as well, too. I mean, he rarely loses. Um, I, I'm a huge fan of Kalen DeBoer. And, uh, yeah, again, it's going to be really hard to replace Nick Saban, if not impossible. But uh, I am a huge fan of that hire, and I think they, they really that's, – that's basically as good of a hire. If Dan Lanning says no, I, I think Kalen DeBoer is the next guy I would have called, honestly. And I think they uh, they did a great job luring him away from Washington. And it's going to be really interesting to see how he does with uh, with Alabama next year. I think they're still – I mean, I know Nick Saban's gone, and they lost a lot of talent to the draft and in the portal. I still think Alabama's like a top five or six team in the country next year, honestly. So they, they should still be very much in the thick of it for the uh, comfortable playoff race. I'm curious to ask you, Max, about the ACC. I'm fascinated by that conference. We saw Florida State go undefeated last year and get left out. Clemson and Dabo Sweeney refuses to take a transfer. We'll see how that works out for him, but it feels like that's bubbling on hot seat. Miami and Mario have added an insane amount of talent, but you're waiting for the win-loss record to kind of follow with what he's done on the recruiting trail. I, but now that we got a college football playoff where conference champs are guaranteed a spot to get in, the ACC knows that they will this year. I'm just, what do you make of that race? Is there a dark horse? Do you like one of those three? How do you feel about the ACC? Yeah, it's wide open. It is absolutely wide open. I don't think there's a single team I put in the top 10 of the country right now from the ACC, but there is a lot of teams I put from the 10 to 20 to 10 to 30 range, honestly, from the ACC as well. So uh, Clemson's going to have an elite defense. The qu big question is, can the offense catch up? Uh, can K Klubnik finally uh, be the five-star quarterback that he was coming out of high school? Because he really hasn't shown that yet. Um, so that's a big question for them. Miami, you mentioned it. Miami is loaded, man. I mean, when I was putting together that position unit rankings, they were like, it was amazing to me how much better they were than I expected going into it. The big question for them, though, is, you know, one, can Mario Cristobal be the guy for them? And two, can Cam Ward be the quarterback for them? He's been a, a really high uh, ceiling, low floor guy for most of his career. Um, he, he's going to have to play a lot safer next year in, in order for Miami to really hit their ceiling, I think, because he's got a lot, a lot of talent around him uh, to succeed. Um, I think a really underrated team that not a lot of people are talking about is uh, is SMU. Um, I think a lot of people are expecting them to come into the ACC and, and struggle like the four new Big 12 schools did last year in Cincinnati, uh, Houston, UCF, and BYU. I don't think that's the case. I think SMU is in a really good spot to compete immediately uh, in the ACC, and they might even be a top 25 team in the country too. So uh, they're a really intriguing team, I think. They, they could really make a lot of noise. Preston Stone, their quarterback, you can make a strong argument. He might be the best quarterback in the ACC. And now, I know Cam Ward might get a lot of votes for that, but I think Preston Stone is right there as well from SMU. So um, Florida State's going to be really interesting. They lost so much talent, but they also still have a really some really good players there. So I like Florida State. Uh, yeah, it's it's really Louisville added so much talent in the transfer portal, but uh, we'll see how they can do. Um, so I, it's really wide open. I, I can't really tell you who a uh, the true favorite is right now. But there is uh, like five or six teams that I think have a really, really realistic shot of, of coming away with the ACC title next year. It's kind of wild. You said that you say SMU, and and I think that's an interesting pick. It's kind of outside of the box of of kind of what we've heard. You know, many people think Norvell has kind of proved maybe Florida State has finally arrived. Mario and what he's doing at Miami. It's a fascinating look of college football where the Big Twelve, the Big Ten, the ACC, and the uh, the SEC could all have new teams in their conference win their conference in year one. Yeah, I'm giving Texas a little bit of a, a benefit there, but one of those teams that I'm interested in is in the Big 12. Uh, Arizona, obviously, we know they're loaded. I still was a little surprised that Fish left that situation because they are so they seem so good. Mm -hmm. But Utah was a staple in the Pac-12. took them a couple years. They made the adjustment. They were a regular at the top of that conference, and Whittingham is still there, and Cam Rising's going on year 12 of his career in college football at this point, it feels like. What, how do you feel about the Big 12 and the new edition teams versus some of the staples that have been there for some time, like Oklahoma State, who's returning their whole offensive line and Ollie Gord? Yeah, the Big 12, again, it's like the ACC where it's wide open. Um, I don't know. If, again, I don't know if there's a single team I put in the top 10 right now, but again, there's so many teams to put from 10 to 30, like the ACC. I think uh, you mentioned it, Utah. 
with Cam Rising coming back, Brand Keithy coming back, and you know Kyle Whittingham, who uh, the head coach for them, is always going to have a well-coached team, no matter who is playing for them. They're going to have a really, really well-coached team. So Utah is definitely a thick of it. Arizona uh, might have the best quarterback-to-receiver connection in the country with Noah Fafita and Tetoro McMillan, uh, who I think Fafita is a top-10 quarterback in the country, and McMillan, at worst, is a number-two receiver in the country, at worst. You can make an argument for number one, honestly. Uh, he is special. Um, so I really like Arizona. They got Takario Davis at corner two. He's a top five corner in the country. Might be a first round pick. Uh, so Arizona's really good. I think Kansas is going to be really good next year. Hopefully Jalen Daniels, their quarterback, can stay healthy. Uh, but if he does, you know, you got him. You got Devin Neal at running back, who's a really good running back. Um, the defense, I think, is, is really intriguing, too. Their secondary is really good uh, at Kansas. Kansas State should have a great running game as well and a good defense, I think, again. So they're always in the thick of it. You mentioned Oklahoma State with Ollie Gordon coming back and that whole entire offensive line coming back as well. Um, just got to see if the receiving, if the uh, quarterback play can be better, you know, Allen Bowman uh, there. But, yeah, the Big 12 is wide open, man. There, there really isn't a uh, true – favorite right now and uh, again they went four and eight last year but they're gonna be the talk of every, every offseason is colorado i mean colorado's got a lot of talent at quarterback receiver corner i mean all the skill positions the only problem is do they have the big boys up front on offensive and defensive lines to compete uh because if they do then all of a sudden they are a legit contender with how much talent they have you know on the perimeter but the problem is that the you know the guys up front they, that's where they were lacking last year and we'll see if the new look offensive line is a lot better this year or if it's not, then they're going to be, again, struggling, I think. But, yeah, like the ACC, man, there there really isn't a true one or two favorites in the conference. There's like five or six teams that you could point to and say, hey, I like this team to come out of it. And I'll be like, yeah, I, I understand it. Why? Because uh, I think it's the same thing. You know, those, conferences, those races are going to be so fun to watch as we get down to the final couple of weeks. Tiebreakers deciding who's going to be in a conference championship game. I, I can't wait for that chaos of October, November. I'm curious to ask you about Oregon State, man. It's like – Really hard to kind of nail them down of what to expect. You got so many new faces, so many new players, so many new guys on the coaching staff, a new schedule. Um, you know, they're just trying to tread water and see where this landscape is at in a couple of years. But a lot of wins in the next two years would help their case of trying to get back on the big stage. Just what, what do you have made of Oregon State's offseason? And, and as you kind of look towards this year, what their schedule looks like and how you think they can fare. Yeah, it's been a brutal offseason for Oregon State, honestly, and a lot of it's just not even their fault, right? Jonathan Smith leaves to go to Michigan State. Obviously, a lot of whenever you lose a coach, a lot of guys are going to follow him or, or leave in the transfer portal. That's what happened. And then not only do you have that, but you parlay that with the fact that they're basically not even a Power Four team anymore uh, in the Pac-12. They're one of the two schools left behind in the Pac-12. So again, a lot of a lot of players are going to leave for that too, because a lot of players who went to Oregon State, you know, expecting to play a Power Five schedule. Now you're telling them, hey, you're basically playing a Mountain West schedule. A lot of guys are going to transfer out of there. And that's exactly what happened. So really brutal offseason for Oregon State. Um, they lost so many of their top players, honestly. Um, their entire roster is like completely brand new, it feels like, and, and a lot of unknowns on that roster. So they're very intriguing. And th them and Washington State, who also lost a lot of talent, is very intriguing to me to see how they're going to fare, not technically not as Mountain West teams, but they are playing a basically a Mountain West schedule. Um, how they do with this, these brand new look teams. Uh, but yeah, it might, the fact that they're playing a Mountain West schedule might help them, obviously. And, and you know, maybe they can get some good wins out of that. But uh, the fact that they lost so much talent and they have basically a brand new roster with a brand new head coach, too, that's uh, a little, a little uh, scary for me when we're trying to project them for next season. I, I'm sure I'm going to leave a name off of the list, but just as an example, you've got uh, the Nico kid at Tennessee, which a lot of people are hyped up on him because he came in and filled in at the very end. And here he goes. He's off and running. Obviously, Carson Beck is mocked as probably the best quarterback prospect, at least right now. Jackson Dart at Ole Miss, maybe Lane Train gets him in the playoff this year now that it's a 12 teamer. Uh, we know Quinn Ewers is back for Texas. Who is the best quarterback in the SEC in your estimation? Oh, good question. I think it's pretty clearly Carson Beck. I think he is pretty clearly the best quarterback in the country right now. Um, I, I think he's not a Caleb Williams. He's not a Drake May where he's an absolute superstar uh, going into the season like we expected uh, those guys to be and they ended up being. Uh, but he is a really, really talented quarterback. And I think he plays with precision. Um, he's really great timing as well. He gets rid of the ball quickly. He's very, very accurate. He is, in my opinion, pretty clearly the best quarterback in the East SEC. Um, I think Jalen Moreau and Quinn Ewers are right there after that. I think they're both – and Jackson Dart, too, you could throw in the mix. Uh, I think all three of those guys were in my top six quarterbacks uh, in the country. So uh, you got those guys. Brady Cook from uh, Missouri maybe was the most improved quarterback in the country last year. Um, I had him in my top ten. 
Uh, you mentioned Nico Iamaleva from uh, from Tennessee. He's got a lot of potential. Just got to see it now. Same thing with Jackson Arnold, the new Oklahoma quarterback. You know, the five star kid coming out of high school a couple years ago. Um, he's going to be the starter this year after losing Dylan Gabriel. So, uh, yeah, the SEC is, is a really, really talented quarterback conference this upcoming season. But I do think Carson Beck is pretty, pretty much head and shoulders above everyone else in college football right now, in my opinion. Last one I got for you, Max. Are you an NCAA football guy? Are you eager for the game to come out? And who's the first dynasty going to be with if you are? I uh, I am. I actually, funny story, I just bought a poster uh, that I just got a couple of days ago of the NCAA Football 25 cover, but it's actually the graphic that we made at PFF where it was the uh, the Pop-Tart. It's so like EA Cup uh, 25 and the Pop-Tart coming out. I wish that, that was have been the cover, the cover man. You guys I had it right. Was. I know we, our graphics guy did an amazing job making it. And then someone turned that into a poster and put it on eBay. And I was like, I got to buy this. I bought one for me and my little brother and we both love it. Uh, I cannot wait to play this video game in about a month. Um, that's why I'm trying to you know, cram all my work in as much as I can from now until then. Uh, because I know right when that comes out, man, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a lot of uh, just a lot of days just me just locked in my apartment, honestly, playing NCAA football 25. So I can't, I haven't decided on a team yet. I, I think Kennesaw State could be a lot of fun as the new, as the uh, brand new FBS team this year, the only new FBS team that we have this upcoming season. Uh, but there's also a lot of other teams that'd be a lot like Hawaii is always a great one to rebuild uh, schools. Like I went to Syracuse and maybe I'll try to turn the orange into a national title contender. Uh, I can't, I cannot wait for uh, NCAA football 25. You Syracuse guys, you're always trying to find a way to make a football team good. Man, I love that. Yeah, Donovan McNabb, back in the glory uh, days, baby. We have Kyle McCord now. We got That's Kyle right. McCord now. So who hey, knows? Yeah. Dirt, don't 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 sell Greg Polish short. Come That's on. True. The, the legend true. that is Duke basketball player turned quarterback. I'll get you out of here on this one, Max, because we appreciate an extended um uh, hangout with you here. I know normally our radio interviews are shorter, but um right now it's it's what June twelfth, June eleventh, whatever it is. Uh, Max Chadwick's top five teams in college oh. football, the teams that he thinks at the end of the season in June, and you welcome to change your answer when we have you on in, in August or September, your top five by the end of next year will be who in college football? Okay, so who? Are, so you want me to do my top five teams, or should I, you want me to do top five based off what the playoff seating would be? Because I know the playoff seating is going to be – how do you want me to yeah. do? I can do yeah, both. Let's do playoff seating. Let's do. Let, let's do playoff okay. seating. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll do Ohio State. Uh, number one. I think they're going to win the Big Ten. Um, at number two, I will do Georgia. I think they're going to win the SEC. Oh my God, this is hard now because now I'm trying to think <laughs> of how it's going to be. I think the top was it the top four is got to be the conference the champions. Yeah, conference yeah. champions too, right? So it's got to yeah. be SEC and I mean ACC and Big Twelve. Oh God. Man, is Utah going to be uh, number three overall? Yeah, Utah might have to be number three, and then what? Clemson number four, um, and then number five would be what the the best non uh, champion. Group of five, yeah, yeah, or, or or group of five. Yeah, group of five. Would group of five be the five seed? I'm, actually, I don't think. Oh so, no, right? I think it'd be the. Would it be the highest ranked? I forget. I need to look up. The... I, I got to look it up too, man. This is so complicated. It's. I don't uh, think they I'm... get home field advantage. I think they're guaranteed a spot in the playoff, but they're not yeah. guaranteed a higher seed. You're just guaranteed a spot. You could be in a twelve. I think. I think there are lots to be a twelve. I think. Yes. It's, yes. It's, 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 yeah. Okay. So I, at five, I'll put Oregon. I think Oregon is pretty clearly the next best team. Um. So yeah, I'd probably put that. So yeah, Utah and Clemson are absolutely not top five teams in the country, and and aren't even top ten teams in the country. But based off how this is seeding is going. That's where they're going to be. Uh, so it's going to be pretty. I think the funniest thing about it is uh, Notre Dame, for example, you have to be a conference champion to be a top four seed. So if Notre Dame goes 12-0 and and is by far the best team in the country, they can only be number five in the college football playoff, which I think will be a hilarious uh, thing that Notre Dame fans will ob obviously be very upset about. But, yes. uh, yeah, I think that's that, that would be how the playoff order would be. But I think my actual top five teams are uh, Ohio State, Georgia, Oregon, uh, probably Texas, and then I'll throw Ole Miss in there at five. I think Ole Miss is really good. I think they're going to have a really good year next year. So I'll put Ole Miss at five, for my actual top five. Well, he still has faith in Dabo Sweeney. I don't know how he does, but he still does. Max Chadwick, our great friend at PFF.com. Go, go check out all his great articles, PFF.com. He's a good friend of the program, and uh, it was nice to do a dirt and spray overtime. Talk some little offseason college football. Felt good. I think we need to all keep getting this out of our system, get ourselves <laughs> amped up. Max, thanks for hopping on with us, man. We appreciate it. No, thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it.